They started beating him, they didn't cough him. He was in and out of conscience, in a, full, in a, blood of, uh, a, a pool of blood. And he was, when he was in and out of conscience, when he was out of conscience, he was, he was keeping on saying, V, what's going on? And he kept on knocking, kicking him in the head with their boots, and he would fall back in conscience. And then, obviously, I think I did what any human being would have done. I jumped on them, trying to defend them, but they arrested me instead. And then they gave me a bad beating inside. At the police station, obviously, uh, these strip searched me. It was supposed to be female, because I'm a female, but wasn't female who strip searched me. But when they strip searched me, when they give me back my clothes, they give me back only my underwear. I had no top, I was topless, no t-shirt, nothing, and they left me like that for until they arrest, until they released me in the morning. So they left me for over 12 hours like that, topless in my cell, and then all the cops pass by. And they bring me to another interrogation room with no camera or anything. And there was a big black guy there, a policeman, with other guys, with other police. And he started to shovel me around and beat me. I remember having a big punch and being kicking a chin and all over my body too but more like pushing the wall and with their arms instead of their fists. And when they sent me back to my cell, and when they released me at five in the morning, the next morning, when one of the police officers at the, at the counter, when he was getting me my stuff back, he said, whoa, your boyfriend did a good job on you. And I turned around all shocked like amazed. What do you mean my boyfriend did a good job on me? My boyfriend didn't do that to me, you did that to me. And he started to laugh and he said, no, 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 he did that and you can see the charge for him right there. And I could see on the big white board, it was saying Chris Garden, assault, uh, domestic violence, assault. And they charged him for assault against me, but he never did what I looked like when I got out of that, of that police station. They did that to me. Early January, I was heading to Sanctuary to do a dance. I go strolling through with my pass through the turnstile, and don't I jam up my private parts into the bar and scream because I'm a loud guy. I, I say out loud, F, can anything else go wrong? And two sneak cops who are very young that work for TTC but are signed under the Metro Police because they were Metro Police badges. The nice guy said, come here, as I'm strolling to go down to the south northbound. And my attitude was, what, bud? And we chatted. And he said I was under arrest. So I stanced and said, what are you talking about? Well, now you're under arrest for being drunk. I said, what? four effing beers in my system. I'm dressed in a fedora, a gray suit, and a jacket. He runs my name. Next thing you know, a van pulls up with the ETF. Two sergeants from 51 have a history. It's not that big of a history, but I got warning stars. Now I'm really aggressive. I asked to sit on the floor because now he's saying he's going to charge me for assault because I've stepped on his foot. I'm also being top-notch, buddy, you're fucking with a mental case right now. And I was. I went into Mike McEwen street mode. Sat on the floor, sat there for 40 minutes with a voice like mine, believe me, I drew a crowd, because I have rights, I thought. Really, I had none. Before the room became available, the little room where they write you up, where, they, where nobody can see things, he said to his sergeant, he said, is there no mental act I can get the guy on with a history like his? So he still got his rubber gloves on, which I found amusing. Six foot four, 240 pound idiot in my books. And we went into the room. Everybody else left. And I said to him, I think you're very inadequate in your job and you're probably inadequate penis size because you're a real asshole. I don't get what I'm even here standing through this turmoil for. His partner said, shut up. I got one of those on the chest. I smiled and said, see, you're the type of guy that knock out homeless people. 
I said, with my history, I'm going to do nothing. They need courses, for one, for guys who have anxiety disorders like me. How many, let's say you have uh, 10 friends, 10 close friends from the street, how many of them have gotten beaten up by cops? All of them. All of them. All my friends that I know have got beaten up by cops. For no reason. Mm -hmm. Just for being supposed at the wrong spot at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. I'm carrying things around that I would normally have at home if I had a decent place to live. So I came from Walmart uh -huh. in the different plaza, then then I went into uh, take some money out. The police came in and they asked me why it was there that I'm trespassing. I said I'm going to take some money out. I bank with the CIBC. I've been banking with them since I was 15 in the 40s during the wartime. But anyway, they said I'm trespassing and they want to see my ID. I said I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong, and um, I don't see why I should show you my ID. Oh yes, uh, if you're not, we'll take you to jail. Go to the cruiser and take you to jail. But the other cop grabbed my wrists and really squeezed hard on both wrists and held my hands up like this while he was, the other one was looking through my purse and pulling out stuff. I was uh, pleading with him to take his hand, please, uh, you know, take your hands off my wrist. I'm, I've got bad arthritis in my hands. And he then twisted my arms behind my back and I was screaming with pain and uh, put handcuffs on me. And uh, <laughs> my hand is so swollen, I can hardly open it up. But anyways, uh, I said, you know, yes, I'm 80 years old. And he says, I don't care if you're 100 years old. to play a game, so okay. I play one of them. Um, it's going to be one of them, so I can pick the names out of the hat today, like within the next little while. Yeah. Will that be good, Donald? Okay. I'm just asking. Yeah, who would you like? You got Greg Spoon's off the list. He's hammered out back, so I'm taking him off. 
This is Kim's first time at Sanctuary. Okay. I haven't even given her the, <laughs> the turn. talk about what we are about, so our first thing is you explaining what Sanctuary yeah. is. Okay. Um, so at Sanctuary, we are a church, but even more than that, we're a community. And we're, we're a place that people who don't often experience safe community can have, be in community. So that can be people who are excluded from community because they have significant mental health issues. It can be people who are excluded from community because of addictions or because of extreme poverty. And one of the big gifts of, of Sanctuary is that we really believe that community between the rich and the poor benefits both the rich and the poor. That there's a lot that people who come from relative privilege, like me, can gain from relationship with people who aren't. And so um, we all kind of come together bringing who we are and what we are. We bring our gifts and our strengths and also the things that we struggle with and our weaknesses and we try to live together in relationship. Um, there was a woman, Maureen, so she was coming from an upper middle class background um, from the suburbs. She's a teacher, her husband's a bank guy, and the first time they made it to a church on Sunday, one of the guys who was there came up and we have an open space where anybody can do the communion part, the bread and the wine part. And he was doing the bread part and he was just like talking about all that he was struggling with and all of those things and he said, so God, really God, just in the end, I'm just fucked. You know, but thank you for caring about me anyways, and then broke the bread. And she said that kind of being here for the first time and looking around and nobody reacted with any shock when he swore, she thought, hey, if he can be safe here, so can I. Because um, the guy who was struggling with drugs could swear and rant and talk about what was really going on in his life and still be accepted. Yeah, we're just one of the guys at the, shel at the shelter there. I see them and I go, like, what's going? I see his face is all beaten up. And what happened was uh, he got taken in by the police. And he wasn't said he didn't get vulgar with them or anything. And they uh, laid a good beating on him. He's a native gentleman, and it's all going through the native courts and all that. Wow. Look what they did to me when they arrested me. They turned around and beat my head. You've seen the scabs on my head. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember I that. I still have scabs here. Well, yeah, you do. Yeah, that's mm. from them beating me up when they arrested me. You know, in addition to there being active police violence on our folks, one of the, the struggles we had when I was earlier here it was that we had a lot of charter violations of our folks. So things like the police doing unlawful searches with our folks. Um, I remember being in the park with a guy, I'm just sitting in the park, and the police came and said, open your bag, and then they took the bottle out of his bag. <laughs> and I was like, I don't think that's legal, is what I said, because at the time I actually didn't know, it just seemed wrong. And they said, what, otherwise he's just gonna drink it. Which was like, well, yes, he's an alcoholic, and so drinking isn't perhaps the best choice for him, but there are wealthy alcoholics that will be drinking in, every night, and we don't go through their bags. The police don't go through their bags and, and remove their alcohol. They picked me up for drunk. Yeah, they picked drunk. Me up. They just punched me in the stomach. Like, I sucked it all up. But why? I never caused them no difficulty, no pain. I'm a gentleman. I, I honor them. You know. It's guaranteed. Like, if we're up in a uh, poor hill. Something happens, they'll be cool. But you come down here in the back alleys where no one could see it, mm -hmm. it's a different story. Mm -hmm. Big different story. Mm -hmm. This one is when I was a nursing student, my final year placement was at Homewood, which is a private addictions facility in Guelph. And so I was working with doctors and lawyers and people like that who were had addictions. And none of them were telling me stories of having their rights systemically abused in their substance use, even though you know, some of the stories I was hearing about them u using on the job and them using in situations that are very, very dangerous for other people in a way that um, my friend who sleeps on a bench isn't actually causing danger to other people when he drinks. But 
their rights don't get abused in the same sort of way, right? And so part of this is addiction, but part of this is that we as a society have made decisions about class and that if you're wealthy enough, you can get away with almost anything. And if you're poor enough, you can't. <laughs> Sir, can you spare a smile? Your smile is a great place for you, sir. There you go. Can you spare a Visa, MasterCard, American Express? <laughs> Come on, sir, can you help out today? Since I've stopped working, I've been stabbed 15 times. I've been shot. I've been beaten by the cops numerous times. I've been beaten up numerous times by I don't know how many different people. And that's just life on the streets. I never had a day in life in jail before that. Before when did that. you stop working? Three years ago. I fell. I got knocked off the scaffold and I split my head open 21 stitches. I went from making $40 an hour to making $2 an hour. This really was about addiction, then when I was there at home, when I would have heard all of these stories about how the police have been treating this, you know, head of whatever branch of medicine at a big, powerful hospital <laughs> so badly. And that's not what I heard, right? I heard was that some complaints got in, and so then the College of Physicians, you know, got gathered around him and sent him into training, into this program that cost thousands of dollars a day and did, gave him all of the support and encouragement and care possible, right? And we don't do that for people who are poor. We don't do that for people who are racial minorities. Um, you know, we don't do that for people who grew up in, you know, Regent Park or grew up on a native reserve. And when I see our friends and they're struggling with addictions, can take six months to get into treatment and the treatment programs don't have any sort of long-term care for them afterwards and there isn't help with housing and most of them don't have those sorts of social supports that he had and that matters that they don't have the same sort of care that he did and it's all because of class. Sucker. I bought a pale blue, I bought uh, so the every hour on the hour they can see. <laughs> a friend of mine, he goes by the name New. And um, I actually just encountered him at Sherburn Health this morning. And he was all bruised up and you could tell he had fresh wounds and he had tape on his face. He was there to see a health professional because, because last night at 10 p.m. he had gotten beaten severely, and I mean severely, he's like out like this, by the cops and he's, he's beaten really, really, really badly. They didn't catch no, they didn't find no drugs on him so they beat him so bad, you know? So, they like, silly. And it's unfortunate, you know? Like, I know a lot of people have been beat by the cops. I have, back in my younger my younger days, you know, but yeah, I actually just haven't seen him today. It's really a sad that. situation. Yeah, I know that. I would say that in my experience, there has never been a good relationship with the police and our folks. Um, from the time I remember being here, there were always experiences of people in the community coming to us with real damage to their bodies and saying that they were from the police. Uh, a lot of you know, bruising. Um, sometimes it was you know, more clearly from fists. I remember once there being um, a guy who I could see literally the outline of a boot on his chest. It was very, very visible that that is exactly the right shape it was. Um, usually to the torso, occasionally to the face. Uh, you know, when I started, it used to be a lot of stories of being taken down to Cherry Beach and being beat up by the police there. What I think has gotten worse over the years when I think about it is that it's expanded. It used to be very clearly just the police. 
which is horrible, but it seems to have infiltrated into security guards and larger things like that. It's not just the police, but it's anybody who wears a uniform seems to feel like there's a right then to brutalize our folks. I began working here at Sanctuary in 2005 and worked here for eight years. Early on, I started hearing these stories of people getting beat up or assaulted by police and security guards. I began keeping records just to take people seriously and also to do some advocacy work around those situations. Chris Van Hart's camp and several friends were drinking in this parking garage one cold February morning when security guards from here showed up out of nowhere and started beating on them. We spent months trying to get the security guards charges, but in fact, when police showed up on the scene, it was Chris and someone else who were taken to jail. Uh, we even filed a complaint with the Office of the Independent Police Review Director, but nothing ever came of it. Iggy was stomped and kicked right in front of this parking garage while he was handcuffed and cooperating with police. My colleague Greg Cook and another sanctuary friend, Seven, were witnesses to the whole thing. I heard a commotion outside, so I looked out the window and I saw um, some police on bicycles just across the street, so I ran down. Um, there was one individual uh, who's indigenous um, that I know um, who was handcuffed and sitting on the curb, and then I looked again and he was face down on the ground, still handcuffed. Um, and being kicked by, uh, by the police officer over the next weeks and even months as I tried to follow up with a complaint to the police about the behavior, um, I was essentially stonewalled. More cases of security guard violence and threats have happened in this parking garage than we can count. One guy fell from the top under mysterious circumstances and his leg was badly shattered. A sanctuary friend named Jason had his wrist badly lacerated when security guards handcuffed him harshly before handing him over to Toronto Police. So Doug came to us through a connection with the Mennonite Church. He was um, basically hired by them and seconded by us to be a Mennonite presence on the streets. Um, and what I learned really quickly about Doug was that he uh, is a Mennonite who's, who grew up a Baptist, and so I always say that he um, approaches Mennonite ideals with a Baptist zeal. <laughs> and so when I talked about earlier about how we all bring our gifts and our passions to the community, um, Doug's gifts and his passions were about pacifism, about peaceful and nonviolent solutions to problems, and about justice, and particularly justice for those who experience the ex experience justice the least. So how that worked in terms of Doug being on staff is very quickly he had a, a strong sense of the injustice that our folks were experiencing, particularly at the hands of the larger organizations like the police, and that the people who are in our society and given the power to do things like handle weapons should be, be skilled in things like conflict resolution and crisis de-escalation and all of those sorts of things, and that it was completely unjust and impossible for us to care for somebody after they've been beat up by the police and not also be working to change the police system. And so in the midst of Doug doing kind of a pastoral outreach role, he very quickly became our community advocate for people who had been experienced police injustice at any level, whether it would be physical violence or other types of injustice. What's your last name? B H I K R A M. Okay, and your first name is? With your push on the group. Joseph? No. Go by Joseph? Yeah. Okay, we'll go by Joseph. You arrest me before here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. What, what's your date of birth there, Joseph? December 7, 53. And that makes you how old right now? How old are you right now? Well, right now you're not in any distress, so there won't be anybody, any medical reason no, to come here. Keep going, officer. Everything released, threatened to. 
Over the course of seven years, I tried to pursue justice in 35 cases of people being beat up by police or security guards or other people in authority. And not a single case was an officer or security guard ever charged. Not a single one. 51 division officers beat longtime sanctuary community member Brian Hutching mercilessly for no apparent reason with billy clubs and social housing on George Street. An officer fell and broke a limb while trying to chase Brian up the stairs. Police then issued a totally bogus press release claiming that Noof had completely overpowered officers during this incident. When he was found several days later, they beat him again in the apartment where he was found, then laid a third pounding on him at 51 Division. Brian appeared in court with staples in his head from the first beating and wounds all over his body. volunteering at the church here? Uh, nine years. I mean, it's always been a good thing for me because it keeps me grounded. I've had housing with Sanctuary for six, and I'm going on one year on my own now. Things are all good. Things are all progressing. I'm close to my family. I have grandchildren. Um, I have great friends. I got people that uh, I feel part of the community. So tell me about one interaction you've uh, had but I was going home one day and I had the key in the front door of my building and uh, a cop came out of his car decided to ask me who I am. So all I did was ask why. They proceeded to come towards me and stop me from going in and saying um, that I, I, I look like somebody that had just committed a robbery. The Toronto Police Service has a big problem. And their biggest problem is that they want to pretend that they're not human. They're not talking to our young men and young women as though they're fellow citizens. They're talking to them as though they are superior. And they are in many ways. When you have body armor and you carry a Glock 22 and you have pepper spray and you have the thin blue line protecting you and around you with the police association, you are superior in many, many ways. But that is a superiority that is not based on law, and nor is it a moral superiority. It is actually a very immoral superiority, and is one that must end. They walked me down like saying they were gonna to talk to me, had me empty out all my pockets, everything, check the bag I had, and then they started to use aggression in the way they talk. So I said, listen, I'm not putting up with this. And then another cop came out, and they both grabbed my arms, trying to put the handcuffs on. And I did not fight back, but I did not let them exactly do that. I just stood there. And they couldn't do it, so they forcefully, one other cop just turned around, took the pepper spray, and sprayed my eyes. But I could not see or nothing. I was burnt for two days. Burnt for two days. Yeah, my eyes are burnt. This is very important. This is, these are our sons and our daughters and our wives and our husbands, even our fathers and our mothers, and our grandfathers and our grandmothers, who are being abused, who are being killed. And then those crimes never go punished. They had the street blockaded, and that's Milverton Boulevard, where Michael was killed. Um, so this is Toronto East General Hospital, and Michael was a patient here. He was expecting to be discharged. He was inadequately dressed for the weather. He was wearing only a hospital gown, uh, only stocking feet with no footwear, uh, and a toque. Um, and the temperature that day was about zero degrees. It was freezing. It seems that the first thing that Michael did once he left the hospital was to come to this convenience store, um, and that he picked up a couple of household scissors off the shelf 
And then he left the shop and he appeared to be trying to get into uh, different houses, uh, trying the doors, going into the backyards, uh, rattling the doorknobs and trying to get into a house. Um, we don't know why, whether he was looking for a place to hide, whether he was cold uh, or what, but those who encountered him found him disoriented and confused and, and clearly in distress, wearing the hospital gown and no footwear. Um, and he didn't really answer anyone's questions, so he wasn't communicating with those whom he met on the street or in their yards. Um, in 1988, there were a number of police murders in our community. And the community was outraged. For far too long, we've had uh, our community under almost a virtual state of siege by the Toronto Police Services, at that time the Metropolitan Toronto Police. And the, there were various members in our community uh, that came together, notably Mr. Dudley Laws, uh, Mr. Charles Roach, uh, among others, who decided that something had to be done. So they came together and they formed an organization which they called the Black Action Defense Committee. And the mandate of the Black Action Defense Committee was to be an advocate and a lobby on behalf of our community against the tyranny of the Toronto Police Services. He did get to a, into a house, uh, and he went to the back door and he smashed the back window, and the owner was not home. What she found when she came home that evening was that he had been on every floor of the house. He'd opened every single door of every single room and every closet within every single room. And her sense was that he was looking for a place to hide. And her house is quite spare, uh, the furnishings are quite sparse, and so she says, there is no place to hide in my house. And so he left the house. And as she reflects on that, she says, I wish he'd stayed in my house. He would have been safe there. And I think that's a challenge for all of us in the community, that you see someone in distress wearing a hospital gown, rather than backing off uh, to invite them in. Uh, offer them a coat, offer them a drink, offer them a seat at your table. And they would have been, he would have been safe. Throughout the 1980s, there were a number of uh, shootings and killings and beatings within the black community by the Toronto Police. Uh, coming up until uh, 1988, and I believe it was the Adams Report that was uh, written uh, about race relations in Toronto. And it was there that uh, Judge Adams began to speak about the need for a civilian oversight. And so he talked about then, about having some type of civilian accountability over the Toronto Police Services. And that was really the impetus within the government for the formation of what was to become the Special Investigations Unit. So Michael had come out of one of these laneways and into the street. And in that narrow space, there were, I estimated, 12 police officers. And the first thing I saw and registered was the, the blue hospital gown. And I said, this is a man with some kind of mental issue. And he's out here on this cold day wearing only a hospital gown. Where's the mental health support for him? Where's the mental health team? It's only later I found that we have very little in the way of mental health supports for the police. Then I saw the officer nearest me raise his arm and then I heard three gunshots, bang, 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 and Michael fell. And that was so shocking to think that they would use that lethal force immediately and without any other attempt to contain him or, or restrain him in any other way. At this point, he's going nowhere. There are 12 police officers around him and several police vehicles. And I'm thinking later, if the rather slight shopkeeper felt willing to tackle him physically to try and grab the scissors back. Can't 12 highly trained Toronto police officers with all the tools and training at their disposal contain him in any other way than shooting him dead? So when they uh, originated the Special Investigations Unit, we were told that it was going to be a civilian oversight body. 
we accepted that at face value. Only to find out very shortly thereafter that it is not a civilian oversight investigative body at all. That really what it is is a pro-police lobby comprised almost entirely of former police officers on the investigative team and 100% of the investigators, investigative managers of the SIU are former police officers and they will do anything to protect each other, to protect that thin blue line, even against the very citizens, we the very citizens that they are sworn to serve and protect. Uh, no officer took my name or wanted to know who I was as a witness. The Special Investigations Unit has never brought justice to our community. Uh, even today, uh, in the Toronto Star newspaper, uh, there is a full-page article about police lying. Um, lying to judges, and lying in court, fabricating evidence. This is nothing new to us. Uh, we know that the police fabricate much of their uh, evidence we know in court they lie blatantly. I think for the police, the story they're getting as they rush to the scene, I'm sure sounded very different from what I observed. So they could arrive on the scene uh, in quite an agitated state, thinking they have someone quite dangerous who's armed and been attacking people. And then they meet this man in a hospital gown. So at what point do you stop and rethink and reevaluate the situation? Move away from the radio reports, um, move away from whatever hysteria or hype was, was given to the story as they arrived on scene. And then just 12 trained officers look at this man and try and assess what's the real danger here uh, and how are we going to respond to that? What is his need? What is the community's need? How do we serve and protect him and the rest of us? So there's going to be a coroner's inquest now. But that, it may be a while before that happens. Yeah. yeah. Now that the SIU's, you know, done their white Because he's watch. only, he was only 29. I know, he got away with it. It's not right. The night that Michael Elligan died, we had been just kind of tweeting and on Facebook and talking about what are we going to do in response to this because not only was this a shooting of somebody who was mentally ill but it was in many of our own neighborhoods. I, I live in that area and and one of the witnesses was a friend of ours of Doug's and mine and so we couldn't just let it pass and so we decided that we were going to have a vigil on the steps of the police and there were about 12 of us there. There were uh, there was at least one doctor, some nurses, some social workers, a couple kind of street pastor types. And of the 12, the majority of us at some point in our lives had talked down somebody with a knife. Because we didn't have the weapons, we had all learned the skills of how to de-escalate somebody, even when they were mentally ill and or drunk. Uh, we all had had the experience of somebody is there with a knife or a gun or a weapon being threatening and we had figured out how to do it and that the police who are out on the streets every day with people who are violent don't know how to respond to somebody who's mentally ill and with a weapon except for shooting is is a travesty it really is and um, and it's also a tragedy If you ask me why I'm here with my three-month-old son on a February evening, it's because we can no longer tolerate having our city turned into a nightmare. We can no longer tolerate having our city turned into a nightmare of fear, a nightmare of intimidation, a nightmare of police violence, a nightmare of police impunity. But most of all, we are here tonight to say, this is our city, and this is enough. Yeah. Yeah. Enough is enough! Our next speaker will be Anna Willits. Anna is from the Toronto Police uh, uh, Accountability Coalition. She's been out this as long as, uh, as just about anybody, so we're ha glad to have her here to say a few words tonight.
Thank you everybody for coming out tonight. It's a really sad thing to see that we, so many years later after Otto Voss's death, after Albert Johnson's death, after Sophia Cook, after so many people, took, after Wade Lawson, after Charles McGilvery, um, so many deaths, so many unnecessary deaths. I just want to say that um, a lot of people are trying to figure out, you know, how can we get uh, the police to stop doing this. And I know a wonderful letter to the paper this morning that Graham Bach wrote was quite clear. Uh, and I agree with Graham that what we have to stop doing is calling the police, especially when we're dealing with people who are experiencing a, a mental health crisis, especially when we are dealing with situations in our communities that we can solve ourselves. We need to be learning the skills where we can talk to each other in crisis, where we can take responsibility for situations that are going on around us, where we can talk with people in calm ways, uh, talk, talk, call them brother, call them sister, give them space, take the time that is needed. I know that I have done it when people are in trouble. I know that many of you have done it when people are in trouble. And these are things that we can do. I just want to talk a little bit about the reality that people experiencing mental health crises face on the streets. I know people will talk about the reality that racialized people and Aboriginal people in this uh, city face the very different reality from the average middle class white person who is able to ignore the fact that this is happening. There should be thousands of people out here protesting the fact that this has happened once again. Uh, and we have to do our work, especially those of us with with privilege in this community to talk to people who do not have the day-to-day -day experience of being harassed, of being stopped, of being questioned, of being searched, of being thrown to the ground, of being thrown against a fence, of being told that they look like somebody who has committed a crime. This is the daily reality for so many people in this city, and it is not the reality for people who look like me. And I, people like me and all of us need to be talking with our brothers and sisters about the reality that so many face. Chris Guardian died five and a half days after a severe beating by multiple officers from Toronto Police 14 Division. The initial coroner's report cited a combination of alcohol and drugs administered at the Don Jail. So the SIU simply dropped the case without further investigation. The OIPRD never interviewed any of the five civilians in the alley that day. One of those civilians in the alley was Chris's girlfriend, Veronique. We haven't done nothing wrong. We were just drinking. We were not even in a back alley. We were not even trespassing because we were behind a business and we had the permission from the man who owned the business. He, even, he used to pay us for us to clean the place. We were drinking there for over three years. We never, never had problem. It's like we were in the back of a balcony. If it's a private property, they had no right to come and jump us like this without saying anything. And can you tell us again what happened that time with Chris and Ronnie? Sorry to have to. Sorry to do it. If you, if you can't, it's okay. I don't want to. See what happened? We were drinking in Pebble Beach. Me, Steve, Chris, Veronique, Steve's girlfriend, Sue, we're all drinking, having a good time. I hung out in Kensington Market for years. And we all had a group of friends that mm -hmm. were constantly, every day we started off the day together. Mm -hmm. So it was just another normal day for us. And we were there every day. Everybody knew where to find us. We called the place Pebble Beach. We were all sitting there having our drinks. And my friend Veronique was, had to relieve herself and she went behind a parked car. 
and her boyfriend came up to her and they were having a verbal ar argument mm -hmm. and I came over to tell them, you know, keep quiet, right? Like, you're getting too loud, blah, 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 blah. And a woman kept on yelling, stop making noise, stop making noise, but we didn't take care of it because we weren't, we weren't making noise. But out of the blue, out of, I could see was cops showing up from everywhere. So there's like 30 cops jumping over the fence. There's like 10 of them on Chris, 3 of them on me. Police cars were pulling up the alleyway. They actually broke the fence coming over it. It's an 8 foot high fence with lattice. And they just came over it like gangbusters. It was just wow. like, whoa, what just happened, right? And they just, Chris and Veronique, didn't see the police officers coming up behind them. And they jumped on him, and they went down behind the car, and it was just a sea of cops on top of him. I couldn't see V and uh, Steve, because they were around the corner. They had me pinned down, I couldn't do nothing. But all I could hear was So I could hear for like, good three minutes. That doesn't sound long, but for People stomping on your head for three minutes, that's a long time. And now all I can remember is when I turned around, I saw Chris. Chris went, what's going on? And he pushed him so hard, he went flying face down on the pavement, and he never got up from over there. They started beating him, they didn't cough him. He was in and out of conscience, when a pool of blood. And Veronique stepped aside, and about seven, eight officers all hit him at once and his face went off the ground. Yes. And he was, when he was in and out of council, when he was out of council, he was, he was keeping on saying, V, what's going on? And he kept on kicking him in the head with their boots and he would fall back in conscience. And another police person pulled Veronique off to the side. Three officers came at me and they just started ripping my clothes off, going through my pockets. And as this was going on, the cops still had Chris on the ground behind the car. And you can hear him screaming, like they were giving him the boots. And Veronique was like, leave my boyfriend alone, it's wrong. She was just telling him, leave him alone, leave him alone, leave him alone. And the officer says, I'm under arrest myself for rape, attempt rape. And I'm going, I don't know what to say to this. I'm trying to explain to him, like, why would I be raping a girl with my girlfriend right here? And my girlfriend's trying to say, this is not what happened. They never told us why they showed, they showed up over there, why they jumped on us that way either. We had no clue, only at the police station we started to hurt. It's because a woman had called and said that a, a, a female was getting bang raped downstairs. But when the, the, the officer arrived, there were two female, three male. Nobody was being hurt, nobody was being raped, nothing like that. We were friend among friend having beer. And 14 Division with us is notoriously violent. Like it was all the rookies that just got hired onto the force. Like they didn't say words, they just came in wanting to kick our ass. And they had all my other two friends up against the wall, Spread Eagle, searching them. And they had me um, handcuffed and my girlfriend's crying beside me. And when they turned me around, they were just pulling Chris up. And his face was just a sheet of blood. Like you couldn't see his face for the blood. And the next thing I looked up, I seen the ambulance take him away. He had his head all wrapped up and the blood was going through the bandages and that. I didn't see Veronique attack the police officer after when she saw his face and that she flipped. I, see, I remember hearing her scream, but they were putting me in the police car at that time, arresting me. In the car, they didn't touch me. In the detective room, they didn't touch me. And when they strip searched me is when they touched me. Because there are no cameras. And don't get me wrong, like I, there are some good officers like, who are very well oriented with street people. They're not confrontational. They actually talk to you. They actually come by and like, I've had them buy me coffees up here. Mm -hmm. You know, they, have, they care about your well-being. But there's a lot of officers in certain divisions that only have one mandate, seek and destroy. Then after this is all over and done with, for the next three, four months, I would stop 300 times. I, I'll just be walking on the street and the four bike cops will surround me up against the wall right now, we're searching. Sorry. 
It was constant harassment after the fact because Chris had died a couple days later. And uh, they were just constantly, oh, I hope your friend rots in hell. Just as they were driving by, they rolled down the window, hey, Steve, how's your friend doing? Is this worm food yet? And, like, it took me a while because of what happened. And I finally went forward to the Sun newspaper and did a story on him. And it, like you said, it took six months for me. Like, I was really fearful for my uh, well-being. Chris's case is really just one of at least five rather eye-popping instances of 14 Division police violence in 2011. Just recently, Ontario's Special Investigations Unit cleared the 14 Division officers who were looking for a trespasser and took Charlie down, inducing a fatal heart attack after he didn't answer to a name that wasn't his. Charlie hadn't talked since a terrible car accident 40-some years earlier. His mom pleaded with the officers, whose names we'll probably never know. And Charlie is on there, and his face turned blue. And look, I said, his face turned blue. His eyes are rolling. Oh my God, you're killing him. You're killing him, you stupid. I said, shut up and get over there. I will not, I said. Meanwhile, two weeks before Chris's death, Sergeant Ryan Russell was run over by a snowplow driven by a homeless person who was uh, mentally unstable. Uh, Sergeant Ryan Russell was given basically an international state funeral. So this is how it goes. Someone who uh, is a police officer is killed by someone who's homeless and there's all the pomp and circumstance. When a homeless person is killed by a police officer, nobody cares. We had tried so many different things and then I heard about Chris's death and his friend said that he had been beaten up badly and he died a few days later. Some of the friends even talked about doing the same thing to a police officer that they had done to Chris. In fact, one of them told me that they were tracking a particular officer. Um, I said, we can't do that. That'll just end up with more of you in jail and it won't do anything anyways. And they said, well, Doug, what are we supposed to do? Uh, you're going to the media, the complaints, all of that won't work, and you know it. And I did know it. So I suggested that we talk to some of my friends from Christian Peacemaker team, and they suggested that we not only do a demonstration, but that we do some nonviolent direct action training leading up to a demonstration. And they referred me to Lee McKenna, who's done trainings on nonviolent direct action here in Ontario and all over the world. Let me introduce some, some new folks that have come up and make sure they're okay. Rebecca here is filming. She's my next door neighbor. She does a lot of documentary films. This is Samuel. Samuel. His first lesson. Oh, I guess he was here for one of the other ones. What we often do in this kind of training is just, is that we use a situation that is familiar to one of you, that has happened, actually happened to you. Something just happened downstairs. And uh, one person it has obviously been, is under the influence. And he was, he was calling for Steve, saying, Steve, I don't know if the plan was to go out for a smoke, but he then came and confronted Steve, with whom I was having a conversation at the time. I got no whole night for that, okay? What does one do to uh, de-escalate this situation? Rather than what happens is something like this. It's a kind of, um, starts with A, B then at least mit, uh, meets, sort of like a game of poker, and then raises. And A then meets and raises. And then it just goes so like this. Who's all in. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There was only one alternative. Yeah, which is... Flight or fight. Yeah. No, that is... But no, but the, the, other, the other was... The other We've was, been here before, how many? Hey, street justice. <laughs> <laughs> resolutions to things, but when you're being standing off and you're facing adversity, there's only one way to handle it. So? So what do you do when you're assaulted? Assault back? Yeah. No. There are other, other options. <laughs> what world do you yes. live in? What world do this, you live in? There is much more power, and you're just going to have to uh, take my word for it for a while. Whoa. There is far more power in the nonviolent response. Yeah, but you're still going to get beat. But see, the thing is, 
that what would I do? What that? Let's just say. When was the last time you had somebody come and pull your head and sit? Come out here now, bitch. Drink with us for a week and spend a time outside to see how you uh, want to act after. You know, play it. This isn't play acting. This is life and death out here. Please. Can we act this out? Hey. <laughs> I'm going to show you something. Okay. Okay? I'm not going to hurt you. Right. Okay. You ready? Yep. Excuse me, ma'am. Come <laughs> on. <laughs> oh, Give me some peaceful okay. resistance now. See, the thing is, Give I... Give me some peaceful resistance you would, now. You would get there is no peaceful resistance with that. Sorry, darling. I didn't mean to do that to you. But that's, the, that's, the, that's the whole thing right there. No, but see, the thing is that I... I'm sorry. No, that's right. No, like, listen. I understand what you guys are doing, okay? In a peaceful protest, there is resistance peacefully, okay? But in a violent confrontation, there is no peaceful resistance. It's... Get eaten or eat them. Yeah. And that's what just good the way it is. Does it do? Who said it was good? That's just the way things are. Hmm. Well, if we want things to stay the way they are, I, I guess. It's I didn't a say that either, Doctor. No, I'm not saying. I have to say question. It's a real question. So, what do you think she should have done? There's a, there's a Fight back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Poke my eyes. Poke my eyes right there. <laughs> When you're living on the streets and when you have confrontations, just like I just happened downstairs, there is no, excuse me a sec, can we talk about this? <laughs> Are you kidding me? You might as well just punch me out now. Well, I think two things. One is that it's not all about talking. I think, you know, Lee's part of groups that physically get in the way of situations. You know, we would show you a YouTube video right now of somebody that Lee worked with regularly and, and really pissed off a lot of the times this guy too, who stood stand right in front of a tank. You know? And what that's happened to him? He got run over. No, he won. <laughs> this that. was in Israel. This was in Israel. And 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 uh, that's that's one thing. But earlier you were talking about if you don't fight back you might lose your place in the pecking order, right? Yeah. Well part of what's going on that we're Combating is that there's a pecking order in our right. world, right? That, yeah, right? And one of the pecking orders is that the police uh, are at the top, and they're the ones that can use as much violence as they want. They're the ones with the guns. So what we're talking about here is how do you change the pecking order? Because we can learn to fight back all we want. I can tell you what, we all went and got guns here. We might, we might do some damage, but we would lose to the police eventually. In the midst of trying to find something that would work with these training sessions and the demonstrations, we stumbled across this film project where people were able to tell their own stories and their own words of being assaulted by police and security guards. Do you think there's anything we could do as a community to stand up to them? What's, what's the best thing we could do? To keep doing this, you know, putting out the word, bring it to the public, like, cops aren't as good as they say they are. Bring it out to the public guy. Just do it like we're doing here, you know? Mm -hmm. Tell our stories. Uh huh. I think what we're calling, what we're in now, phase two. Phase one was um, doing the training, getting Steve on video, doing the 10 minute video we did on 14 Division Police Violence. I'm not anything off the movie because what it says, like Michael says, it exemplifies the fact of the struggles, tribulations, everything we do. So that's really important. important. Yeah. But are we yeah. missing anything? You're missing a comment mm -hmm. from the police. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. you're, you're missing what are they gonna do to change yeah, what's yeah. their reaction yeah. to this? What are they like, even if it's negative, it's a positive towards this film. But yeah. do you think we should show them the film and ask them to respond um, or they don't have to respond to anything. I know, they're above the law. 
do you think we should try and show what they do more? Like follow reactions. them around and... You won't get a reaction. No. And if you so follow then, them around, you're going to get arrested. You yeah. think so? <laughs> they, they'll, they'll, they'll harass you and arrest you. Yeah, because you, so you know, you're the stalking them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we tried that one day and they didn't... We didn't have enough bait, enough donuts, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> all the cops are on steroids, they're all hanged yeah, the up. Yeah, chewing gum, you can tell. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, like, it's like, about how big you are and how tough you can be. It's not about public service, it's about force and enforce. That's all it is. There is no, um, you know, the old, you look at the, the old movies. Um, you know, the beat cop knew everybody in the neighborhood, right? Today, classic, classic example. Yeah. Today, there is no such thing as a beat cop that walks a beat on the streets no more. And so just pull up, enforce, and, and react. That's all it is. There is no comprehension of what the neighborhood dynamics are. There's nothing like that today. And when it came time to planning the demonstration, some people wanted to do a lockdown in 14 Division directly, and others were um, you know, those with experience of getting abused by those cops were afraid that if we even set foot within the division, um, that it would just be an invitation to more police violence. I gotta think, like, you know, admit to myself, I've been arrested enough times now. You know, I, I should know the difference not to go to the rally, you know, but when I hear someone's been killed, you know, it's just, it just makes it that much clearer, you know. Eventually we decided on um, the demonstration that we did, which was called Public Silence, Police Violence. To decide whether justice should be done. There is no justice. I should be sad and I feel light because I got all of you behind me. Good. <laughs> it's a good feeling. Uh, this happened to me roughly a day and a half ago. I was uh, drinking with some friends and I decided to go home uh, because I was fairly intoxicated and uh, the cops stopped me. They took me in. I was strip searched and that didn't help. Uh, the next thing I remember is uh, being get, getting my ass kicked by these cops. And I mean, like as you can see by the by the injuries, uh, you know they didn't go lightly on me. You know, and I was called a faggot. You know, a drunken Indian. You know, and it was. Uh, it was quite surreal, to be honest, because I'd, I've, I've never been assaulted like that before. And I was released the next day, and I'd ex I've been ex like uh, experiencing dizziness, you know, nausea, which was which I thought was kind of well, that's some kind of head injury or something like that. So I went to the hospital and. Uh, they ran a series of tests, and I did have a concussion. Like, they, 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 they basically said, you know, well, there's not a lot we can do for you right now. Um, had you come in sooner, you know, we could have attended to you, you know, with proper care, I guess. 
Uh, but the reason was was because I was in custody, mm -hmm. you know, not getting the treatment I was supposed to be getting. So, you know, it's gonna. I think it's gonna take a little while for me to get over it, you know, because it's it really affected me, um, not just on the outside but on the inside as well. Yes. Like I lost my faith in the people who. You know who you're supposed to have faith in, basically. You know to help you and whatnot. So. How did it feel to join the march? I was honored to be there. I I, I was completely honored to be there and um, to and I was glad to express and share you know this story with with you know other people who actually care about it um, and it's one of those things that are swept under the rug. APTN spoke to nearly a dozen First Nations men who call the streets home. All say Toronto police have a bad reputation for being bullies and racist. I was just walking through here one time following an officer who had just ticketed two First Nations people in a row and had walked right by similarly situated white people. People, white people sit down at bench drinking and all he ticketed were people who were First Nations. I called them out and I said, what is this, a ticket a Native Day? And uh, we jawed back and forth for a while and finally he said to me, well, you know who you need to lobby is Queen's Park and get these people more beer money. I can't do anything about this. The cop said that. The cop said that directly. But Hallam says he knows more than just discriminant ticketing. Yeah. He claims he's tallied dozens of assaults on homeless people by police over the last seven years. He says the majority of them are First Nations. Why, why do you think the First Nations people make up over half? Well, I mean, it's uh, several different levels of racism, I mean, uh, or, or historical problems. Uh, you know, First Nations people make up about 3% of the Canadian population, but what we're seeing out here on the streets, and this is true in most major Canadian cities, we see about 20 to 25% of the people that we work with are, are First Nations. You know, we need to work at the roots of what's what's causing the, the poverty and the racism and the, the things that are putting First Nations people out on the streets here. I was going to the shopper's drug mart to steal a bottle of rub. And then uh, well, they're talking to me and saying, I stole this and that, and then I get the beat down. <laughs> what did they, what did they, who beat you down? Uh, to security. Were they in uniform? No, no, it was basically wannabe cops. Uh -huh. Security, and they uh, they beat me down and, uh, well, you know, they make sure there's no marks on your face or anything. They hit you and, uh, you know, the places don't show up. Did they hit you, kick you? Uh, what they Yeah, do? hit me, kick me, uh, you know, to do all the uh, usual. Shit kicking. Uh -huh. yeah. oh, and then I had to sit around there for like three hours in handcuffs waiting for a uh, living division to come get me. Uh -huh. These cops don't really care. Yeah. They think they're above the law, I figure. That's what I think. Did the cops What's look it? at the beating you had taken at all when they showed up? No. They didn't give a crap. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I'm getting a beat down. You know, I took a beat down and it was so. Because they thought I was just a drunken thief. Uh -huh. Drunken native thief at that. Yeah. Nothing has changed in 40 years in Toronto towards uh, dealing with native people. And that to me is a very shameful shameful way of looking at things when i look when i go and visit the communities in this city i have a good relationship with the cities the native agencies in the city organizations they have nothing good to say about the toronto police service nothing at all the police here in the city they're harassing our people constantly every day including if you're colored and now if you're if you're a white person and if you're uh, act up a little bit you know, you get shot, you get killed, and that's it. And, and that to me is a scary thing when you, when you put these gun-toting, John Wayne-style kind of people behind those guns. And that to me is uh, unacceptable. And I think that they should be ashamed and made accountable for what they've done. 
You have no right to do that. 52 Division, 55, 14, Peel Regional Police. I know all about those places. I used to get thrown down the stairs at 52 Division. They used to see how fast and how far I can roll. Banging my head all over the pavement and concrete. And after a while, they would, here's what they would say. You fell down them stairs, didn't you? And if I said something differently, did I get more of that? And today, it's right openly done, right on the streets. They will hit you on the, with the, um, the uh, telephone book around you, around your chest, so you will bruise inside. And you'd be in pain for several weeks after you get beaten up. And this is what happened, but now, but now what's happening is four or five of them will get, will literally gang up on you to take you down. They don't taser you or nothing, they just kick the shit out of you and that's what it comes down to. One of my friends just got beat up last week, last Friday, last Thursday, just walking home. He was beaten so severely, they called a stinking dirty drunken Indian. This is what they come up with and look at themselves on the weekends too. They should look at themselves on the weekends. Look how much they drink. Sitting around the bars and and accosting hard people, calling them names. I ended up with post-traumatic stress because of the cops from all the beatings I had from them. And after being my best friend to death, that's where I got it from. 14 Division. Mm -hmm. They look at us like garbage, right? Mm -hmm. So they can do what they want with us. Well, once they get me on going, like, fuck you, you drunken Indian. You got no fucking rights here. Stuff like that, you know? Just mm -hmm. racist terms. A lot of racist terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Putting, a, putting me down all the time, you know? Cliff and Donna were rucked up by hospital security guards here at St. Michael's in a case that made national news. Cliff was dragged unconscious by his hair and left outside in minus 20 degree February weather. The CEO of St. Michael's Hospital apologized and two security guards were fired, but one piece of justice remained unserved. The security guards were never charged criminally. Police were called to a domestic dispute at my friend Dallas's apartment involving another couple, and that couple had left by the time the police arrived, so they just put the boots to Dallas after kicking down the door. Uh, police were not charged. There you go. Us through a little bit of it. At the G20, you were bending over to pick up a cigarette, or you were told this later. You had no idea. No, I was. I know what I was doing. I was bending over to pick up a cigarette, but but they accused me of trying to flatten a tire on a bus. I didn't know anything about a bus. I didn't even know what G20 stood for. Matter of fact, I still don't know what it stands for. <laughs> I just noticed a bunch of people show up and act like assholes. <laughs> Maybe Something. that's what it stands for. <laughs> Could be. I was supposed to be cheese for. <laughs> <laughs> For the citizens of Toronto, the days up to and including the weekend of the G G20 will we'll live in infamy as a time period where martial law set in the city of Toronto, leading to the most massive compromise of civil liberties in Canadian history. That's the people, that's the police. What are they doing to these people? They're terrifying.
Where do they want him to move to? Where do they want him to move to? coming down the side of the street and I saw the cigarette butt, so I figured, well, what the hell? Hell, I, I smoke, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that looked appealing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't have any, so. I, spent, I tried to bend over like that when I was coming up. The police came from the front and behind. They were bike cops because they were yellow. And they would say, well, why, what are you trying to do there? Why are you doing that? I'm like, well, what are you talking about? And then they said, you're trying to flatten a tire. I'm like, what are you talking about? I didn't even know the damn bus was there. <laughs> but they accused me of trying to flatten a tire on a bus. I didn't know anything about a bus. You know, it was just, it's hard enough to pick up a cigarette. Would you even be able to flatten a tire with your mobility? No. I got to unscrew all that and, are you kidding me? That's what the hell I want to do all that for. <laughs> And then the cops came from the front of the bus and from behind, and instead of handcuffing me to the chair, they handcuffed me behind. I left me just laying over there like that. And then after that, they took me to a cage and left me in there for a couple of days. Hey, Bob, in Canada, that's, that's something that's yeah. the same Canada way. <laughs> <laughs> this is in Canada right now? No. Wow. Now. That's right. You're in G20. <laughs> Fast forward 2010, we bring back to life a 1939 act that leads to the arrest of over a thousand people with 99 charges outstanding. Um, to me, that's disturbing. Yeah, they left me in a cage and they took the wheelchair. I didn't have my nurse, my medication, nothing at all. And just let me out that morning and God, you know. Did you drink or eat at all while you were in there? Um, I couldn't. I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't do anything. I was laying on the floor. Everybody stayed a big circle away from me because I didn't smell good. You know, I didn't look good either. I'm just laying there on the floor, there's nothing I can do. There's like about 16 people in there, and it's not a real big cage. So, uh, well, there's video of you getting water at one point, but it was, yeah. you told me it was. Yeah. What color was it? You didn't drink much of it because. No, it was. It was supposed to be orange juice, I think, but it looked more like piss. I don't know. <laughs> it didn't look drinkable. Like that. Do you remember in, in your cage at all trying to transfer where you you had a manual chair mm -hmm. and they tried to. Um, you tried to transfer to sleeping on the bench. That's how you ended up on the floor. We got video of it. It's not good. No, I don't imagine it is. But I didn't. I didn't ask to be here. And uh, I'm still alive. I'm still here. So did any did any of them apologize or anything or? None of them would even let me know who they were. They all had covered, but the badges were covered. You didn't, you couldn't see nothing, you know. So they didn't, they weren't familiar to you? you no, know? the only one that was familiar to me was the staff sergeant that got me out of there. And he recognized me from before on the streets and asked me what the hell I was doing in there. I said, I have no idea. He said, I'll wait. Five minutes later, he came back and said, get him out of here. And that was the only thing that got me out, you know. And it was because he knew me from before. And I told him, when I told him what was going on, he said, well, when he put me on the bus to bring me back, he smiled, he said, oh, and don't be flattening any more tires. <laughs> so, I like, so that's what they were charging me with, was trying to flatten the tires. In the four years before the G20, Toronto police killed seven people. In the four years after, they've killed 20.
It's impunity. They got away with it. They got away with it on a massive scale. The bubble touches me. I'm going to be arrested for assault. Do you understand me? Bubbles. Yes, that's right. It's a deliberate act on your behalf. I'm going to arrest you. The only solution is to tackle their culture, this belief that their job is to make people comply. It is not their job to make people comply. It is their job to work with communities. It is their job to protect people. And whenever you hear the people, the police talk now, all you hear is about how they were ensuring officer safety comes first. And this is not what we pay over $100,000 for some of these people to do. We pay them to show some courage. We pay them to show some smarts. We pay them to show some compassion and some ability to understand how to do their jobs. Yes. And if they can't do it, we need them off the service and we need people there who do know what back. they're doing. We, we want, want our money back. back. We want our money back. <laughs> See, I, th I think a donut on a string is uh, not really bad compared to a bullet in a gun. So. See, the cops act very differently when they're on camera or not. This is an accident. Shame! 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 At one point, uh, Alok Mukherjee, the chair of the Toronto Police Services Board, told me, you know, policing started out as a way for the community to protect itself against poor people, and it looks like we're going right back to that same situation. Tara and Ryan were beaten by security guards in or near a TTC station and reported it to my colleague Greg Cook immediately. Tara definitely wanted to follow through. We were still trying to arrange a time to have a long talk about what had happened and what to do when she died tragically. Police ruled that death to be a death by misadventure. When we call the police, way too often, it makes the situation much, much worse. It does not make the situation better. Training is not doing it, as Graham said today. They have been trained within an inch of their lives, and they're not paying any attention. They, uh, when they are in these situations, uh, they are overcome with panic. They are overcome with their own stereotypes about the people that they're dealing with. And folks, people like Michael Elligan and, and Otto Voss and all the other people who have been killed, especially people who are in a mental health crisis, Robert Dejanski and many others, people in their lives have worked with them and dealt with them when they were in crisis. Their families, their friends, their neighbors, people who work with them in uh, different kinds of community programs. And they were able to work with people and calm them and help them without shooting them. And the reason that they were able to do that is because they didn't have a gun. And if you don't have a gun, or if you don't have a taser, or if you don't have a billy club, then you figure out how to work with people in a way that helps to calm them, helps to uh, help them get back in touch with where they are, helps to ground them, and you keep your compassion, and you keep your wits about you, and you get smart. But instead what we do is we call these officers in yellow and in black, and they come in, and they come in in swarms. They never come in by themselves. They come in swarms. They surround people. They start to yell at them. They start to make demands of those people. And they interpret the, uh, when people don't respond right away in the way that they demand. They interpret that as belligerence. They interpret that as...
as non-compliance. They are taught that if you don't comply, you are the enemy and you are to be attacked and tackled until you do comply. And they get so overtaken with adrenaline and they get so overtaken with their weapons that they don't know when to stop. And they don't stop until it's way too late and it happens over and over and over again. And the only solution to that is to take the guns out of their hands. The billion dollar budget of this police service comes at the expense of social services and programs that would have helped Michael Elligan, which are used by people like Charlie McGilvery, which are used by all sorts of other people in crisis. And the way and we have less of those and more of this, and this is a shame. We need to change their thinking about that, whether or not they get compliance. Charlie McGilvery would have complied if they'd given him two minutes to fucking respond. If they'd listened to his mother, he would have complied. The deaf man that was arrested at the G20 and beaten up would have complied if they had brought in an ASL interpreter. We need other responders. We need the police not to be the first on the scene when people are experiencing crisis. We need other people on the scene who know the hell what they're doing. Thanks. So that's a little bit about some of our struggles in this community. It's horrible the way, the way we're all treated. And I really feel sorry for these people that have to, have to live on the street because uh, now, from what I understand, uh, since the people have been speaking out, is that they, uh, they're uh, bothering our, the homeless people now, they're kicking them off the, the corners. They they're telling them, move on or you'll be arrested. Yes. That's what has uh, been going on the last two or three months now. But that we have the power. Yes. We put them there, and we also have the power to take them out. Nothing has changed and nothing's going to change. The only one that's going to be able to bring change is the grassroots people themselves. That's every one of you guys here today. We're the ones that are going to bring that change. I should be sad and I feel light because I got all of you behind me. Good. <laughs> it's a good feeling. Stay back. 